Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Dennis Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now, here is Pastor Dennis Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this Family Bible Study Hour. Ready to get back into our Father's Word here at the chapel. We're going to pick it up today, Numbers chapter 9, verse 17. Uh, we invite you to get your Bible and join us if you care to. We'd love to have you. Get ready to have an old-fashioned Bible study here at the chapel. In our last lecture, we ended up uh, with the tabernacle being reared up in the time of Moses. And I invite you to come with me to 1490 B.C. And when that tabernacle was reared up for the first time, uh, there was a manifestation of our Heavenly Father, a cloud that was over it immediately by day and every night, uh, that fire uh, visible to the children of Israel. You know that that had to be uh, reassuring to them, knowing that, that their Heavenly Father was real uh, he was with them. He was dwelling among men at the time. And, you know, had they followed his instructions, everything would have gone along just fine. But uh, we're going to see that, uh, is, you know, I'm not going to be overly critical of the people of Israel of the time of Moses because we're the same today. We, we don't do things God's way. Just turn on the evening news if you don't believe me. Uh, you'll see that there's not very much godly uh, or righteous about people in general without God. But every day that, that cloud over the tabernacle, every night the pillar of fire. And let's ask that word of wisdom in Yeshua's precious name. Father, we ask you to open eyes, open ears this day. Uh, it's getting really close to time to pick up the uh, tent pegs and head out for the promised land. Let's see how it goes. Verse 17. And when the cloud was taken up from the tabernacle, then after that the children of Israel journeyed. This word journeyed is nasaw, and it, it literally means to take up the tent pins and uh, begin a journey. And in the place where the cloud abode, there the children of Israel pitched their tents. And uh, we learn that the Ark of the Covenant in chapter 10, verse 33, went before everyone. And in other words, the, the cloud over the Ark of the Covenant decided where Israel was going. And that, of course, was our, our, our Lord. Uh, decided where Israel was going to encamp and how long they were going to stay. And, and we'll see over the next several verses that fact repetitiously stated. And I think that that's to, to show us uh, how totally dependent the people of Israel were on our Heavenly Father. They couldn't move without Him. And again, if they'd have followed His instruction and His lead, uh, things would have worked out a whole lot better. God in control, though, uh, protecting his children by day and night. Verse 18, At the commandment of the Lord, the children of Israel journeyed, and at the commandment of the Lord, they pitched or encamped. As long as the cloud abode upon the tabernacle, they rested in their tents. And when the cloud ascended away from the tabernacle. That was a sign to, uh, to move out. It was time to break camp and move on. Verse 19, And when the cloud tarried, or prolonged, long upon the tabernacle, many days, then the children of Israel kept the charge of the Lord and journeyed not. They observed that which was to be observed towards the Lord. And, you know, consider that you had quite a few elderly people that uh, were making this journey as well. So um, God, no, no doubt, was considerate of 
uh, how f how long you know a younger person can uh, walk and move a lot easier than an older person, and this was a, a long, hard journey, and it was a long, hard journey for the young people. Uh, think how hard and long it was for the elderly. So God in control as to how long uh, it was before they would move out. Verse 20. And so it was when the cloud was a few days upon the tabernacle, according to the commandment of the Lord, they abode in their tents. And according to the commandment of the Lord, they journeyed. Again, we see that repetition over and over and over of how God was in control. And I ask you, you know, when you have major decisions in your life, uh, do you follow God's lead? Do you, do you allow Him to lead you? Well, you can, and I'm not talking about, you know, when you have a decision in the morning when you get up or what shirt you're going to wear or what dress you're going to wear. Uh, God gave us gray matter between our ears, and He doesn't expect us to need help deciding what we're going to wear today. But when you have major decisions in your life, well, I'm talking about when you're considering a career change perhaps, or, or a move to, to, to be closer to work or family as the case may be. Do, do you, you know, there's nothing wrong with, with asking or throwing out a fleece and, and asking Father for a sign, you know, which way should I go? Uh, and oftentimes He'll give you the answer. Verse 21, and so it was when the cloud abode from even unto the morning, and that the cloud was taken up in the morning, then they journeyed, whether it was by day or by night that the cloud was taken up, they journeyed. And that cloud uh, had the appearance of, of both uh, a cloud as we think of it today, and also fire. In uh, Exodus chapter 14, verse uh, 20, when uh, Egypt was pursuing after uh, the armies of Pharaoh, better stated, were pursuing after Moses and the Israelites when they f first came out of uh, bondage to the Egyptians, there was a tremendous cloud, dark, black-looking cloud as the Egyptians viewed it but on the other side that the, that the Israelites viewed, it was the appearance of fire. Again, that had to have been a, a comfort to the children of Israel as they were uh, breaking bonds with Egypt and, and, and first leaving. Verse 22, or whether it were two days or a month or a year, that the cloud tarried upon the tabernacle. Remaining thereon, the children of Israel abode in their tents and journeyed not. But when it was taken up, the cloud was taken up, they journeyed. <clears throat> in Exodus chapter 13, verse 11, it states there that the Moses speaking, but the, the Lord speaking through Moses, the Lord will bring thee into the promised land. And that was his intent, was to bring Israel into the promised land, to lead them. <clears throat> Verse 23, And the commandment of the Lord, at the commandment of the Lord, they rested in the tents. And at the commandment of the Lord, they journeyed. They kept the charge of the Lord at the commandment of the Lord by the hand of Moses. Yahweh would lead uh, the question is, would they follow? In verse 15 through 23, I mentioned uh, probably uh, too often, but again, the repetitions there are to awaken the consciousness of the total dependence of Israel on the Lord and His gracious care of them. <clears throat> now in chapter 10, uh, the first 10 verses are still at Sinai. And when we began the book of Numbers, uh, I mentioned that from Leviticus, the previous book in, in the book of Moses, the third book of Moses, um, we had that chapter 1, verse 1, 
began at the first day of the first month of the second year. And when we finish chapter 10, we'll be at uh, the 20th day of the second month of the second year. So everything in Leviticus up through verse 10 here in the book of Numbers occurs at Mount Sinai and occurs within a relatively short period of time, 45 uh, to 50 days. Chapter 10, the last minute preparations before it's time to uh, pull the tent uh, pins and start their journey to the promised land. Chapter 10, verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, verse 2, Make thee two trumpets of silver, in the Hebrew tongue, shofar, is the word trumpet, of silver. Of a whole piece shalt thou make them, that thou mayest use them for the calling of the assembly and for the journeying of the camps. Now, uh, what these silver trumpets will be used uh, by the priest and if it's, you know, you consider you've got over two million people, I've stated in an estimate, uh, 603,550 fighting men, uh, plus their wives, plus their children, plus the elderly that were too old to fight and therefore would not have been that numbering. So probably 2.1 to 2.2 million people. And when you consider uh, how many tents it would take to house that many people, uh, you're talking about a good chunk of land that would be required and they'd be scattered out uh, from one end to the other. And uh, what the purpose of these uh, trumpets were that, that when the priest sounded them, it was a signal. And as we read in verse two, the signal might be uh, to summons uh, the tribe princes uh, to the tabernacle to, to speak with Moses, uh, or it can be a signal for them to move out, as we'll see in an orderly fashion. Verse 3, And when they, <clears throat> the priest, shall blow them, all the assembly shall assemble themselves to thee at the door of the tabernacle, of the congregation. Now, a couple things about this. Note that when they blow them, it's plural. So we're talking about when both trumpets uh, sound, uh, then that's calling the representatives of the families, the tribes, to Moses at the tabernacle. Now this word blow in verse 3, check it out. It's a, a long peal or, or a long tone of blowing of the shofar. <clears throat> Verse 4. And if they blow but with one trumpet, then the princes, which are heads of the thousands of Israel, shall gather themselves unto thee. Now the tribe princes, there's only one for each tribe, and these are the uh, those selected by name by our Heavenly Father in chapter 1 beginning with verse 5. So, and evidently you could tell the difference at a distance even as to whether it was one trumpet or two trumpets blowing obviously because they could distinguish uh, between who was being summoned to the tabernacle. Verse 5. When you blow an alarm, then the camps that lie on the east parts shall go forward. Now, an alarm is like a battle cry and would have been a, a short, sharp tone. And, the, of course, who was on the east? Well, the tabernacle was always set up that the entrance was to the east. And you had Moses, Aaron, and the priest uh, were camped immediately outside the east side of the tabernacle. And then you had the, the camp of Judah, which was the tribe of Judah, obviously, but also included the tribes of Issachar and Zebulun. 
So when the, the trumpets blew with a short uh, battle cry uh, uh, tone, it was a sign that Judah was to move out first. But uh, and when we get to verse 33, we'll learn that actually Judah wasn't the first ones to go. It was the Kohathites who were responsible for carrying or bearing the Ark of the Covenant on their shoulders were always in the lead when they broke camp. Verse 6, when you blow an alarm the second time, then the camps that lie on the south side shall take their journey. They shall blow an alarm for their journeys. And of course, the second camp uh, was Reuben, uh, which includes not only the tribe of Reuben, but Simeon and Gad as well. Um, and then it automatically assumes that we know that uh, from previous chapters that the tabernacle would be the next uh, to move out. Uh, then the camp of Ephraim, which included Manasseh and Benjamin. And then last but not least, the tribe of Dan, which included the tribes of Asher and Naphtali. If we get to it today, we're going to see that this, uh, the order that we were led to believe or, or the way it reads, probably better stated in earlier chapters, is a little different, but there's a good reason for it. More on that when we get to it. <clears throat> Verse 7, but when the congregation is to be gathered together, you shall blow and this is the, the prolonged uh, peal or tone, but she shall not sound an alarm. Verse 8, And the sons of Aaron, the priest, shall blow with the trumpets, and they shall be to you for an ordinance forever uh, throughout your generations. And of course, the priests at this time, there were three, Aaron, uh, his uh, oldest living son, uh, Eleazar, and the youngest, uh, Ithamar, verse 9. And if you go to war in your land against the enemy that oppresseth you, then you shall blow an alarm, that's the battle cry, the short, uh, sharp tones, with the trumpets, and you shall be remembered before the Lord your God, and you shall be saved from your enemies. And uh, Leviticus chapter 26, verse 8, we learn that if we do things God's way, uh, He'll bless us and be with us in war. And, and it states in Leviticus chapter 26, verse 8, that five of you will put a hundred of the enemy to flight, and a hundred of you can put 10,000 of the enemy to flight. Uh, later in, in chapter 26 which of, of Leviticus, which has the blessings and the curses of God, if you're not doing things His way, uh, you'll flee at the sound of a rustling leaf when no one pursues you. Verse 10, Also in the day of your gladness and in your solemn days, these are your feast days, and in the beginnings of your months, you shall blow with the trumpets over your burnt offerings and over the sacrifices of your peace offerings, that they may be to you for a memorial before, this is the face of your God, I am the Lord your God. And as I said when we began chapter 10, uh, that is the 20th day of the second month of the second year after Israel came out of Egypt. Uh, that is the end of the time at Sinai. From this point on, uh, Israel is moving out and beginning their journey into the promised land. Now, this uh, solemn days, or I should say your months, I believe that there actually was only one month that they blew the trumpets. And that would have been Tishri, the seventh month. And because why? Well, the first of the Tishri was what's known as the Feast of Trumps, uh, Leviticus chapter 23, if you're not familiar with that. And they would blow the trumpets, of course, at the Feast of Trumps. 
uh, the Tishri, the seventh month, a very special month. On the tenth day of Tishri, you had the Day of Atonement, uh, and then the uh, the fifteenth day of the, began the Feast of Tabernacles, which was a seven-day feast, and then there was actually a Sabbath following that that closed out the cycle of feasts throughout the years. Also, in the day of your gladness, you will, you will blow the trumpets. Uh, several occasions that happened uh, when uh, uh, Solomon's temple was completed. Uh, they blew the trumpets and it was one example of that. So, um, Israel, God preparing Israel to move into the promised land. You know, there's a promised land in our future, uh, and there are going to be trumps that announce when those particular uh, uh, events come to pass. And I hope you've been studying God's Word enough that you know how to enter the promised land yourself, because He tells us in His Word how we can enter the promised land. We do things His way. You see, things are not going to go well for most of these people. There's only two out of that whole numbering, 603,550 fighting men and, and their families. There's only two that are going to enter the Promised Land, Joshua and Caleb. Uh, more on that as we go. That's, uh, uh, I know the people of Israel are anxious to get started. I'm anxious to get started as well. Let's go with verse 11. And it came to pass on the 20th day of the second month. This is E-R, the month in the Hebrew, on the Hebrew calendar. In the second year that the cloud, the manifestation of God, was taken up from off the tabernacle, of the testimony, time to march into the promised land. Would everything go smoothly? Let's see. Verse 12, And the children of Israel took their journeys out of the wilderness of Sinai. It took them uh, less than 30 days to travel, excuse me, it took them less than three months to travel 200 miles. Uh, they're on the very southern peninsula at Sinai, the south end of the peninsula. They're approximately 300 miles if you took a beeline to the Promised Land. It will take some 40 years for them to uh, make the, the, the next 300 miles when they covered 200 in three months. And the cloud rested <coughs> in the wilderness of Paran. Now, when we get uh, to chapter 33, the, the points of encampment are listed. Paran is actually the third uh, spot after Sinai that they encamped. Uh, Kibroth Hata'ava was the first. Hazareth uh, was Hazaroth, better pronounce, pronounced, uh, would be the second. But Paran, and this is what we're going to see is a, in, in verse 12 was a summary of the events that are more fully explained in the next verses, in fact, the next chapters. Verse 13, And they first took their journey according to the commandment of the Lord by the hand of Moses. Note that God gave the command, not Moses. Verse 14, in the first place went the standard of the camp of the children of Judah, according to their armies, and over his host was Nashon, the son of Amenadab. And in chapter 10, verse 33, again, we learn that the Ark of the Covenant moved out with the Kohathites bearing it before Judah. Uh, the standard, you could think of that as a flag, and of course, the tribe of Judah uh, their ensign was uh, Leo, uh, the lion, so that was the, the uh, symbol on the flag of the camp of Judah. And again, that included Issachar and Zebulon uh, would always, in the case if they were going to war, uh, would fight under the standard, the flag of Judah. Verse 15, 
And over the host of the tribe of the children of Issachar was Nethaniel, the son of Zuar. And these are the tribe princes mentioned once again who God appointed in chapter 1. And over the host of the tribe of the children of Zebulun was Eliab, the son of Helon. Verse 17, And the tabernacle was taken down, and the sons of Gershon and the sons of Merari set forward bearing the tabernacle. Now, as I mentioned earlier that this is a bit different than what we read in earlier chapters. In chapter 2 and 3, uh, it was the order of, of March was Judah, uh, then uh, uh, Reuben, then the tabernacle. But this makes more sense. You see, when Judah first started moving out, it would be necessary for the Gershonites who were responsible for the tent material, the curtains, uh, the ropes, and the, the coverings uh, to start dissembling the tabernacle. The Merarites then would come in uh, for the boards, the bars, and the sockets. Uh, these uh, are families of the Levites. Uh, the Gershonites were given two wagons uh, with four oxen. The Merarites were given four wagons with eight oxen uh, to move. And what we'll see is going to happen is they would just start when Judah was summoned to move out with the sharp, uh, short tones of the trumpets, the Gershonites and Merarites would swing into action uh, taking down the tabernacle, then when Judah was on the way and the two other tribes that were with them, Issachar and Zebulun, then the wagons with the Merarites and the Gershonites would move out, and but that would get them there where they were going to encamp uh, earlier than the Kohathites who were carrying the remainder of the uh, furniture and vessels for the sanctuary and would have time to uh, assemble, reassemble the tabernacle. So we got Judah moving out and then Gershon and Merari uh, with the, their respective portions of the tabernacle. Verse 18, And the standard of the camp of Reuben set forward according to their armies, and over his host was Elazur the son of Shadur and the standard, uh, the flag of Reuben, the symbol was the man, <clears throat> Aquarius, verse 19. And over the host of the tribe of the children of Simeon was Shulamiel, the son of Zerai Shaddah. Verse 20, And over the host of the tribe of the children of Gad was Eliasaph, the son of Duiel. And this is one of them that's uh, mentioned wrong, incorrectly in chapter 2. Uh, I make that chapter 1 where he's called Ruiel. And the resh, the letter R, or equivalent to R in the Hebrew, resh and uh, delith, the D uh, in the Hebrew, are easily confused. So uh, here it's correct. Ruiel is incorrect. 21. And the Kohathites set forward bearing the sanctuary, and the other did set up the tabernacle against they came. And what this is saying is that when they reached the point of uh, the new encampment site, the Gershonites and Merarites would have time to reconstruct the tabernacle so that when the Kohathites arrived uh, and they followed, as we read there, Reuben, uh, then they could have a place to put the, the furniture in the tabernacle. Verse 22, And the standard of the camp of the children of Ephraim uh, set forward according to their armies, and over his host was Elishama, the son of Amihud, and the standard uh, of the uh, tribe of, or the camp, better said, of Ephraim was the ox. And, uh, verse 23, And over the host of the tribe of the children of Manasseh 
was Gamaliel, the son of Pedazur. Manasseh, actually the older brother uh, of the two, and I'm referring to Ephraim and Manasseh, both being sons of Joseph. And But when Jacob was passing out the blessings in Genesis chapter 48 and 49, uh, Manasseh received a blessing. Uh, I should say uh, Ephraim received a blessing. He, the Lord s Jacob said uh, Manasseh would be great, but uh, Ephraim would always be greater. Thus the older uh, serving under the flag, the standard of the younger brother. And over the host of the tribe of the children of Benjamin was Abidan the son of of Gideoni and uh, all uh, Ephraim, Manasseh, and Benjamin, uh, descendants of Rachel. Verse 25, uh, last but not least, and the standard of the camp of the children of Dan set forward, which was the rearward uh, of all the camps throughout their host, and over his host was a Ahizer, the son of Ami Shaddah and Dan not to be slighted for bringing up the rear. Uh, I had mentioned once previously in our lecture on the book of Numbers that you know this would be a slow moving group. I mean, they have their elderly, they have their herds, they have their flocks, they have everything that they own basically that they're carrying in one form or another and you know that would be a slow go and if an enemy was going to attack them, it would probably be because they're overtaking them from the rear. So uh, Dan has a very important uh, position in carrying up the rearward uh, to protect uh, the, those from attack from the rear. Verse 26, And over the host of the tribe of the children of Asher was Pegiel, the son of Akron. Everything uh, organized and disciplined in God's army as they move out for the promised land. Verse 27, and, we'll, uh, and over the host of the tribe of the children of Naphtali was Ahira, the son of Enan. So Dan, Asher, and Naphtali uh, under the camp or standard of, Ephra uh, of Dan, I should say, and the ensign, the flag, the, the symbol was the eagle. Verse 28, and we'll stop for today. Thus were the journeyings of the children of Israel according to their armies when they set forward. And we'll stop there for today. But those four camps, again, we see Judah, uh, Reuben, uh, uh, and then, of course, uh, Ephraim and Dan. And those four uh, flags that they had, first the lion, then the man, then the ox or the calf as it is in the book of Revelation for Ephraim, and then last but least the eagle for Dan, last but not least is what I intended to say. But Ezekiel, when he saw God's throne, he saw these four faces, the, the, the creatures, the four creatures, and John in the book of Revelation saw the same thing when he saw God's throne. So uh, there's something to those four faces uh, that I don't think we understand everything that there is to know about it. I think when we see the throne of God, uh, those four faces are going to be there in some shape, form, or another, and that we have two witnesses, Ezekiel and John in the book of Revelation, when they saw the throne of God, they saw those four faces. Well, we'll see that uh, when they take their journey, it'll only be about three days before the belly aching starts and the complaining and the murmuring. And uh, God wasn't happy with them at that point in time and he let them know. We'll come back in our next lecture and see how the journey goes. We've got a short message. We'll ask you to listen a moment, won't you please? The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It's getting late in the game. You need to know what the Mark of the Beast is. 
As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. No shipping and handling. Just call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also mail your request to Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. Glad you could join back with us. Let's have the 800 number, please. 800-643-4645. That number good throughout Puerto Rico, the U.S., and Canada. If you have a biblical question that you'd like to pose to possibly be answered on the air, feel free to call that number and leave your question. Uh, don't ask questions about a specific individual denomination or organization by name. Uh, we teach God's Word in a positive manner. Throwing out negative about others by name serves no purpose. We simply won't do it. We'll let God's Word do the teaching, the correcting, and the healing. If you're listening by shortwave radio or studying via the Internet uh, somewhere around the world that's unable to use that 800 number, your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Quite all right to mail your questions in uh, being the point. Got a prayer request? We can do away with the 800 number. You don't need a telephone. You don't need a mailing address. I encourage people to talk to their father. You know, he created a way that we can uh, communicate with him 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It's called prayer. Uh, go to him in prayer. I encourage you to make time each day, at different times of the day, even multiple times of the day, to talk with your Heavenly Father. He's the closest relative that you've got. You should be able to talk with Him like He's your flesh Father. Uh, we do have these prayer requests, Father. We come united as one in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. We ask you to look upon these, Father. You know their needs, uh, illness, uh, sickness, uh, addictions, Father. You know if it is your will. A special blessing on each of these. Uh, we also lift up our military troops who are in harm's way around the world. We ask you to watch over, guide, direct, touch, heal in Yeshua Jesus' precious name. Amen and thank you, Father. All right, let's get to some questions. First up today we have David uh, in South Carolina, and David has several questions. How does one know that he has the Holy Spirit? Well, if Jesus Christ is in your heart, you have the Holy Spirit, David. Uh, you feel Him when He touches you and you get that warm feeling. Uh, that is the, the Holy Spirit touching your heart. You see, wherever God and Jesus Christ are, uh, the Holy Spirit is there also. The three are inseparable. Uh, you ought to follow up how, how He... I can't read what you got here. God is leading him. How do we know if God is leading uh, you by the Holy Spirit? You, you feel his help, as I said. You feel him touching your heart. And how he knows he has been baptized by the Holy Spirit. If you were baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, uh, you were baptized of the Holy Spirit. Andy in Utah. Christians say it is okay to kill in war, but when I was a soldier and killed, why do I still feel bad about it? Probably because you have some knucklehead uh, telling you that when you killed, that it's the same as murder, and it's not. Uh, to kill the sixth commandment in Exodus chapter 20, uh, verse 13 states, Thou shalt not kill. Uh, when Jesus is teaching us in Matthew chapter 5, verse 21, Jesus said, You know, you've heard, Thou shalt not kill. That word kill in the Greek language is fon you owe. The prime of it is fon use. It is criminal homicide. Killing the enemy in a situation of battle or war in self-defense 
and protecting the rights and freedoms of uh, everyone in your country uh, is not criminal homicide. Uh, Bobby from Florida, I found you on my TV by accident or God's way. Anyway, I have a question for you. For some reason, I think you are an honest man. Well, I appreciate uh, your, your opinion. I have always believed in God. I just haven't done it his way. Now I'm 77 years old. I went to Bible school when I was young and went to church some, but can't remember ever being baptized. Do I need to be baptized now? I believe in God. I read the Bible and I talk to God every day. Sometimes I don't know if God and I agree about things, but that's a different story. What I want to know is, do I need to be baptized to get to heaven? Oh, what we disagree, you decided to tell me what you and God disagree on. What we disagree on is our so-called president. Well, that's another story is a good way to leave that. Okay, Bobby, on your question on baptism, you know, Jesus is our example, and he was baptized uh, by none other than John the Baptist. Uh, John the Baptist didn't feel worthy uh, to take Jesus' shoes off, much less uh, baptize him, but uh, Jesus asked him to allow it or suffer him, and he did. You know, is it an absolute salvation issue? I don't think so. Uh, you know, there were two male factors, uh, criminals, if you will, who were crucified one on each side of Christ. One of them believed on Christ. And what did Jesus say to him? He said, this day I'll see you in paradise. So I doubt that that criminal had been baptized. But uh, again, Christ was baptized. He's our example. Salvation issue, I don't think so. I think where some people take it to a salvation issue is incorrectly uh, teaching St. John chapter 3, verse 5, where it states you have to be born of water. And they think that that's baptism. It's, that's incorrect. It's being born of woman. What's the first thing that happens when a woman is getting ready to give birth to a child? Her water breaks. As opposed to the Nephilim, the fallen angels who refuse to be born of woman. <clears throat> they won't enter the kingdom of God. Nancy in Florida, why is Cain, well, no, was Cain a Geber due to the fact that he impregnated Eve? Well, Cain did not impregnate Eve. The serpent impregnated Eve in the Garden of Eden. Uh, Cain was the result. Um, and why well, that was Satan's attempt to pollute the seed line through which Jesus was to come. You know, we offer a book here in our library entitled Sargon the Magnificent, and it talks about uh, a descendant of, of Cain, and he was a big one. Uh, he was what would qualify as a Geber. Cain was genetically capable of producing Geber in his seed line. Mark from Nebraska. Genesis 16:12. Ishmael is said there would be a wild man, Strong's 120. Are the Ishmaelites considered Adamic? No, they're not Adamic. Uh, uh, they are the descendants uh, of, of Abraham for sure but he had a, uh, a, a handmaid of uh, Sarah's named Hagar, and that's where uh, Ishmael came from, was Hagar and Abraham. I believe that they are, and, and the, the Hagar was an Egyptian. So I think that we, what we see there is the beginning, and by the way, Ishmael went on to have 12 uh, sons, and I think that was the foundation of the Arabic, uh, not Adamic, but Arabic nations of today. Nancy in Pennsylvania, or uh, 
recently enjoyed your study of numbers. Well, I'm glad you're enjoying it. Question, how did over two million Israelites hear God's instructions in the wilderness? If it was passed down, I'm sure it changed by the end. What do you think? Well, you're, you're talking about the old uh, story where the general told uh, the major and then the major told the captain and the captain told the lieutenant and the lieutenant told the sergeant and the sergeant uh, told the corporal and the corporal told the private and by the time it got there it was uh, changed. But, you know, the word of God was written down on scrolls and what happened every feast day, every, every uh, holiday if you could think of it or Sabbath the priest read God's word to the people. And you know, the, the, and we, we might think, well, how do we know in all the translations that God's word hasn't been changed? Well, if you have a companion Bible, you have an appendix uh, concerning the Masera. And the, the Hebrew was written in a way, and the word Masera means to uh, transfer something from my mind to your mind and that means without any changes and the Masera was designed and written to where if you changed one letter it, it, uh, red flags went up and you knew that somebody had been uh, messing with the translation the original Curtis in Iowa I only have one question is there an actual hell, a physical place where if we don't make it when God judges us that we go to and will remain there with knowledge of where we are and be there for eternity? Or will we just be cast into the lake of fire where we will be totally consumed even the memory of us? And I hope you will read this on the air and you got it and you've, the, the latter is the correct answer that uh, in, in Revelation chapter 20 you have what's known as the great white throne judgment and at that point the books are opened up and we're judged on our works and some will go into the lake of fire uh, which is where Satan and his end up uh, some will go into the eternity, but those who go into the lake of fire, the lake of fire is not an eternal place. Uh, after uh, the, the, those that go into the lake of fire, to me, uh, they're going to go up in smoke. And how long does smoke go up? Smoke goes up forever and ever and ever. But heaven, uh, you know, I, I don't want to be in a heaven where I look out and here's Uncle Ned uh, frying like a piece of bacon in hell and screaming and hollering uh, to beat the band. Uh, that's not my idea of heaven and uh, they're blotted out. We don't have any memory as, as it states in, in Revelation chapter 21, God will wipe away all of our tears and there will be no more sorrow. There'll be no more death. And why is that? Because Satan and his are gone. They're gone from memory. Marion in Mississippi. Uh, would God be upset at me when he returned because I do not study his word often due to my situation? I have a problem with reading and understanding his word. It really breaks my heart. I am constantly praying that God will bless me with wisdom, knowledge, understanding. I am a church-going person. Uh, I'm in church every Sunday morning and Bible studies on Thursday. Thank you very much. Well, you're welcome very much, Marion. And you know, uh, uh, in the book of, of James, uh, chapter 1, I believe it's verse 5. Uh, we learn there that if any of you lacks wisdom, ask God. So you're doing the right thing in praying and asking. But, you know, God promised that he would send uh, pastors and teachers to, to help people who have difficulty understanding 
God's Word. So um, I hope you find a good teacher here at Shepherd's Chapel or uh, if not here, elsewhere, someone who can help you understand God's Word. Rosalie in Oklahoma, where is it in the Bible that talks about the cross and the crucifixion? Well, all four of the Gospels have chapters dedicated uh, to the crucifixion. Uh, Matthew, the first of the Gospels, chapter 27. Uh, Mark, chapter 15. Luke, chapter 23. And John, chapter 19, all have to do with the cross and the crucifixion. Uh, and you might be surprised to learn that in the Old Testament there's prophecy that Christ would be crucified on a cross. Uh, Psalms, which is not often thought of prophecy, uh, you have the crucifixion of Christ uh, down to the Roman soldiers gambling for uh, the raiment of Christ, and that's in Psalm 22. Uh, uh, Jeremiah, excuse me, Isaiah chapter 53 uh, also uh, tells us of the crucifixion and even that uh, Christ would be buried in a rich man's tomb, Joseph of Arimathea. Anne Marie in New York, Pastor, how can we know what church or religion we should be learning from? I am a Christian. Please tell me how God feels about this. I love you all and your teaching. Well, thank you for that. We love you as well. I have a friend that studies someplace different and wants me to go with her. What's important to God? Well, there were only two churches that Jesus found no fault with in the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3. You'll read there about the church of Smyrna and the church of Philadelphia. And what was it that those two churches taught that Christ appreciated? Well, it was the fact that they knew who those who claimed to be of our brother Judah, but did lie and were of the synagogue of Satan. And that's the Kenites. And, uh, and, and in other words, churches, a church that you want to go to today, if they teach you what, who the Kenites are, uh, that's a good church according to Jesus Christ's logic in, in Revelation chapter 2 and 3. If they don't teach you who the Kenites are, uh, Christ would probably find fault with it. Not probably, I know he would. Uh, he did the others. Anne Marie, I guess in New York, uh, you got two questions in today. I was recently baptized in my church. I feel amazing once I come up from the water much is the blood of Jesus. I felt free as everything was erased from me. How can I instill this in my children? My husband is not interested. I know I can read God's word to my children, uh, but I believe it would be harder with my husband. He doesn't want me to even talk about it. Well. Uh, Anne Marie, you need to read 1 Corinthians chapter 7, uh, which tells us how to deal with relationships. Uh, in particular, the part that I want you to pay attention to is where one of, of, of a marriage couple is a believer and the other is not. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. You know, and if your, if your husband doesn't prohibit you and your children from practicing your faith uh, it shouldn't be a problem. And all you can do is uh, be an example to him of, of, of how a Christian lives and hopefully he'll see that you're being blessed. Pray God will open his eyes as well. Raina, and I don't know where Raina's from, Please give me scripture that teaches that Satan is going to come before Christ. Okay, well, write down 2 Thessalonians uh, chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. And in verse 1 there, Paul tells us, uh, I want to talk to you about the return of Christ. That's the second advent, not the first. And verse 3 uh, Paul says, let no man deceive you, 
that day, the day Christ returns at the second advent, will not come until the son of perdition be revealed. Now let's see, who's the son of perdition? Well, some people will try and tell you it's Judas Iscariot. They're wrong. Perdition means perish. There's only one who is already judged by name to the lake of fire. His name is Satan. Ezekiel chapter 28 uh, verses 18 and 19 tell of his destruction where he's called the king of Tyre. But uh, that, that gets it done. It follows in verse 4 that there's first going to be a, an apostasy, a falling away. And, and when Satan shows up, he's going to be promoting himself uh, above God and all that is uh, of God. Uh, you can read about that in Isaiah chapter 14 in the Old Testament where he's called Lucifer. Jerome and Arkansas, what did God create? When did God create the dinosaur? Well, in the first earth age. And there was no flesh man on earth in the first earth age. But we sure had dinosaurs, but how do we know? Because we have skeletons of their remains. At the Catabol, uh, God destroyed the earth at, at Satan's overthrow. And, but you can read about a description of the dinosaurs that would not be left out of God's word where they're called behemoth in Job chapter 40. And I'm out of time. I want you to know that I love you a great deal. Why? Because you enjoy studying our Father's word in depth. You know, it makes his day and pleases him very much when you read the letter that he wrote to you, the Bible. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, help us reach out to others as well. Uh, one thing, though, that's most important, and it's this. You stay in his word every day. Every day in your Father's word is a good day, even with trouble. Do you know why? It's because Jesus, Yeshua, is the living word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Dennis Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast CD, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a CD catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at the same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.